First of all, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for staying until this last talk on a Sunday. It means a lot. I feel incredibly humbled to be asked to speak at this extraordinary literary event. Um, it, it's a real, real treat to be here. So, so thank you for attending. So my name is Flora Soames. I'm an interior designer. And I've recently published my first book with Rizzoli called The One Day Box. Now, many of you might ask why the slightly curious title. My publishers certainly still to this day ask that question. And the short answer is it is ostensibly a story about my completely out of control collecting habit. <laughs> and the people and the places who've really shaped my tastes, my eye, my homes, and my work today. Um, central to this story are a handful of key personalities, and you might say some pretty forceful women, one of which was my grandmother, Mary Soames. I'm very fortunate to have my aunt, Emma, with me here today, who has recently published her mother's wartime diaries, Mary Churchill's War. And today we're going to explore the making, the story of home and the making of a home as it's played out in front of your eyes and my eyes through the generations of this family. So Emma, let's kick off. Um, set the scene of Mary's childhood at Chartwell. Well, um, my mother was born in 1922, which was the same year that her father bought Chartwell. And um, there's a big gap between her and her next sibling, Sarah. Um, there was eight years between them for the rather tragic reason that um, there was a little girl called Marigold who died of uh, septicemia when she was less, not even three. And my grandmother was already expecting my mother. And my mother told me that she thinks that um, if she hadn't been expecting her, she probably wouldn't have had any more children. She was so distraught. Um, so my, grand, my mother was sort of brought up virtually as an only child, because the other children were so much older than her, at Chartwell. She was definitely a child of consolation to her parents, and she was certainly the Chartwell child. She spent her entire childhood at Chartwell. She was educated at the school in the local village, and it was only at the outbreak of war that she moved to London with her parents, first to um, Admiralty House and then to Number 10, uh, which is quite a cool place to start your London life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she was above all a Chartwell child. And the, and, 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 um, and the buying of Chartwell, I'm right to think that that happened the year that, that Mary was born. That's right. Um, and it was not without drama because when uh, Winston and Clementine first went to view it, um, Winston immediately fell passionately in love with it and saw its endless possibilities for him playing around with diggers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and building walls, etc. My grandmother, however, was more circumspect and noticed that the house was facing the wrong way. It was built against a high, a steep hill, and the house faced the steep hill, which was, to make matters worse, covered in purple rhododendrons, which is her least favourite colour. <laughs> but um, my grandfather was not to be gainsaid on this, and without telling Clementine, he went off a few months later and bought it at auction. For £5,000. A fortune. And it is. It is uh, uh, an imposing, extraordinary, quirky house. I mean, it was a Tudor farmhouse that has been adapted again and again through, throughout the, the centuries. But they had a rather complicated relationship with their architect, Philip Tilden. It wasn't a smooth running project. No, they had terrible rows with um, their architect. Um, they discovered dry rot, and the whole thing took twice as long as they thought. Where have we heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> but they moved in, and I think uh, what we're going to continue to see um, 
through some of these images is, is that Chartwell is very much um, the repository of both of their quite distinctive styles. You know, you could say Churchill's quite masculine, almost quite alpha male sort of tendencies in, in sort of a, a robust style and cer certainly sort of a want for, for more grandeur than, than Clementine ever, ever aspired to have. I mean, that is a theme that went throughout their marriage. Uh, my grandfather's desire to spend money, live high on the hog, and my grandmother's sort of always 360 degree awareness of the need to save money, to which back. at this stage in their life they really needed to do. And I mean, what I love about this room, as a result of a complete remodeling of the house that, that was not what they'd set out to achieve, you know, they were able to start again in the library. And, and this, this house and this room was very much a working room. This was, in fact, where his secretaries and researchers would work, and later on in his life, where he'd watch the racing. But what, you know, she, she very much took the decisions herself as to, to the schemes throughout the house, and crucially, the colors. She had a very distinct sense of color. She had a, a wonderful sense of, of, of dress, with her dress. She was, you know, it was, wasn't flamboyant, but, but incredibly stylish. And again, here, what we're seeing is her touch with the, the, the chrysanthemum curtains, the deeply comfortable chair, um, but also his bookcases laden with books, and the later map showing the planning of, of um, the D-Day landings, which, which was installed there. Um, but it was very much a working house. And I, I think what's interesting about Chartwell today, and is, is very unique for a house of the National Trust, is that as we are shown it today, was very much as Clementine and my grandmother, your mother, Mary, set out for it to be viewed as a family home and as it was lived in the 30s and 40s. And I think that's, that's, that's an interesting demonstration of, of how strongly they felt they did not want it to be understood to be a museum. And, and, and that is true in the instance of these rooms as we see them today. Yes, um, it certainly is. Um, I, of course, knew the house in the 1950s when it looked rather different because the house was reconfigured to accommodate my grandfather in his old age. Um, but what I do know is that when the National Trust gave a lunch when they opened Chartwell and invited lots of members of the family, many of the Churchill children were absolutely overcome to see their childhood home recreated as, it, as they remembered it down to the last cushion, you know. And that uh, my grandmother um, asked my mother really to oversee and also the first curator was a woman called Grace Hamlin who had been one of my grandfather's secretaries during the war and knew the house intimately in all its different incarnations. And I think, um, you know, going on with that theme of both of their, their input in the putting together of this, their family home that they really loved, this, this I still think to this day, incredibly chic dining room, the, the iconic water, uh, the iconic Warner's print, um, Aram, Aram Lily print, glazed chintz on the chairs, and, and Churchill commissioned heels to make the two dining room tables, the overflow for the children next door, and, and the chairs, and you know, talk about an eye on the detail. He, he said to them, it should be comfortable and give support to the body. It should certainly have arms. It should be compact. One does not want the dining room chair spreading itself or its legs or its arms as if it were a plant. <laughs> I mean, together they were incredibly involved. They definitely had different views. I mean, Grandma's approach to sort of hiring a decorator was not one that... <laughs> No, I wouldn't she have been said, on books today. You, you no. I'm afraid no. not, Flora. <laughs> um, she re regarded um, hiring an interior decorator as, quote, a gross extravagance. Um, but she had very good, simple taste. All the rooms, I mean, that room was sort of made to measure, so to speak, but mm. all the other rooms just have lovely, plain painted walls and rather brightly coloured her bedroom, I don't know whether we've got that, no. had bright tomato-coloured um, curtains, etc. So they were very pleasing um, 
the rooms and also in a funny way quite contemporary they don't feel particularly um, 1930s which is when she did it well they were also incredibly evocative I mean you know grandma wrote about this room didn't she and and sort she of did but also shall I talk you through who's at that table yes so and this was done from a photograph and it's Winston um, then um, tea at Chartwell I think it's called oh okay well, Churchill. we've got Mrs. Sickert, Diana Mitford, a.k.a. Lady Mosley, um, Eddie Marsh, who was um, a private secretary of my grandfather's, an extremely clever man and long-term friend, um, Professor Lindemann, who was his scientific advisor, and then Randolph, Diana Clementine, and Walter Sickert, who was teaching my grandfather to paint using a, what was he using? The magic lantern. The magic yeah, lantern, and that. this was painted with a magic lantern. And this was a typical Yeah, I mean, it was a gathering. typical Chartwell gathering, you know, wor a working lunch, but also family life. Um, my mother's not there because it was taken in 1927, so she was five or something. Um, but it was very typical of the life that went on at Chartwell during the 30s. And Mary and Grandma would speak of this room and their times in it and how it made her feel. Yes. I mean, um, she, if she was, she, in 1942, she was talking to her grandfather about Chartwell. And it, they, of course, Chartwell was in mothballs at that point, and they hadn't been near the place since the beginning of the war. But she was in, made her so um, homesick. I had a sudden stab at dinner and a longing for the old life. I remember breakfast on hot midsummer mornings. Sarah, Nana, that's her governess, and me, round the small table in the dining room. Outside, the wheeled is drowned, submerged in mist, and the sun struggles through. Inside, the amber floor and rush matting make golden, pale golden lights. And she goes on with a long riff all about her life at Chartwell as she remembers it during those dark days of war when by that time she was in khaki. Um, as, as many of us know, um, Churchill turned in his hand to many crafts. You know, he was determined to train to, to, to be a painter and he became a very accomplished painter. And here at Chartwell he was learning to lay walls, fixing the roof, um, digging lakes, uh, the swimming pool, I mean endless pleasure brought from this his, his playground. And one of the things he did was build a glorified Wendy house for, for Mary, for his daughter. Um, and, and the enjoyment he got out of her experiencing this little home. I mean, it had a stove, a dresser, table, chairs, the whole caboodle. And I think a dovecot eventually, it had yeah. its own dovecot. So the, the, the sort of all-encompassing sense of a family living here and, and what they get out of it as a result of of living in, in all four corners of it, I think is, is, is very apparent. I mean, this painting marks so this that is moment. The, this is the painting by Winston from a snapshot of my mother, aged five, laying the foundation stone for the Mary Cot, with her elder brother Randolph holding the bouquet. I think he titled it Mary's First Speech. Mary's First, first Speech. She was presented with a bouquet and then manifested a great desire to make a speech. We all had to stand while she remained in deep thought. In the end, she said she regarded it as a great honor to be called upon to lay this foundation stone and that she hoped she would spend many happy hours in the house when it was finished. Loud cheers. And you were all incredibly fortunate you and your four siblings to also live at a cottage near to Chartwell for some, some of your childhood. Yes, I mean, I and three of my siblings were born at Chartwell Farm, which was just in the valley underneath um, Chartwell, and by then my grandfather had bought it. And my father's first job on marrying my mother was to become my, the, the, the farm manager, about which I think he knew very little, and also the racing manager, which he, about which he knew more. 
but we had a wonderful childhood. I remember Chartwell so well, walking up through the garden to have tea with my grandparents. We swam in the pool, we fed the goldfish. Um, sometimes we were sort of graduated to Sunday lunch at the big, in the dining room. Um, and I got to know my grandparents very well, actually, but um, I had no idea that my grandfather was arguably the leader of the Western world at that point. Um, but there's a very moving letter that Grandma wrote to her parents the night before she got married, which I think sort of illustrates, A, the, the sort of strength and importance of home for this family, but also the, the responsibility and, and sort of anguish that she felt in terms of leaving one and needing to set up another. Yes, I mean, this is when we moved from Chartwell Farm to Hampsell Manor because my mother had so many children, there wasn't room for them all. Um, and this picture was taken, I think, in the early 60s, and it was my grandfather's last, as turned out to be my grandfather's last visit to Hampsell Manor. And my mother wrote this letter to my grandmother, which, although written earlier, could apply to this. I shall seek with every capability within me to help to found a home worthy of the one I am leaving, to build it on foundations that will not shift. Yours will be a cherished, reverenced name and influence in our family life. So moving. It's wonderful. Um, and she took this responsibility to care for her parents, to support her father. She was extraordinarily loyal to um, her father. And she became, in later life, she became the sort of matriarch of the family. And everybody um, sort of deferred to her because she was, as she called herself, the last of the Americans. You know, she, she um, had, she spent the war at his side. Um, anyway, so she had an extraordinarily close relationship with her parents. And there are some very touching letters in here that my grandfather wrote to her on her 25th birthday and things like that, acknowledging the debt that he and love that he had for my mother. But then, the, 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 you know, the beginning of the ever-present struggle that is life with with your your children, her then husband, and and she soon became a diplomat's wife. And and you know, Grandma found a way to sort of embody all of this, and and took with her that lightness of touch in the way that she lived in all of her homes, to this, which was their most um, eminent sort of yes. posting to the British. British residents in Paris. Yes, I mean, although my father was not a diplomat, um, Harold Wilson in 1968 asked my parents to go to Paris because the entente between the British and the French was not as cordial as <laughs> <laughs> um, he wished it to be. So we had four fascinating years living in the embassy. It was, an ex uh, of course, you probably know, it was um, the palace of Pauline Borghese, who was the wife of Napoleon, and w uh, Wellington bought it um, in 1814 when he got to Paris, and lock, stock, and barrel. So all the furniture um, is original, and my grandparent, my grandparents, sorry, my parents slept in Pauline Borghese's bed and there was a, a mirror in the, a sort of chevalier mirror in the bedroom that made you look taller, because <laughs> she was rather diminutive, like her brother. And uh, by then, you're all teenagers, so the, 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 the residence has not necessarily seen teenagers lounging on its, on its furniture. No, but it did then. Point, but it did then. <laughs> and the fabled Salon Vert. Yes, well, that, this became the family sitting room, really by osmosis. And, um, it was where my mother had her desk. It's where there were actually comfortable sofas that teenagers could lounge on. There were, the dog baskets were there. Um, there were two doves called Romeo and Juliet, and there was a mouse that used to run along the dado rail to, to, eat, the, to, to, to eat, eat the bird the doves, feed. Yeah. Um, and it's where my father, in his splendidly patterned dressing gown, used to sit every morning after breakfast 
uh, to interview the chef about the menus that day. Because if you're trying to take, if you're taking on the French, you have to beat them at their own game. <laughs> and, and the sort of, you know, the, 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 the balance between opening your doors, inviting people into a family home, and what can be gained from that? in terms of, you know, the relaxed atmosphere, lack of sort of formality where, where, where that was achievable. I mean, it was, it was her... Yes, well, I think, you know, the fact... I always got the feeling from my mother that she was very, very pleased to have her children around. Mm. And it sort of softened the edges of whatever she was doing. Um, that picture, incidentally, she picked up the habit of smoking cigars off her father. And when you... <laughs> French look at that picture, they say, oh, tellement comme son père. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, she, but she did m mix the informal and the formal. She was sitting at lunch one day next to the General de Gaulle, then president of the French Republic, and he said, how do you spend your time in Paris, Madame l'Ambassadrice? And she said, well, I take my dogs for walks down by, the down by the Seine. And they were off. I mean, they had the most marvelous conversation about dogs, about good places to walk in Paris. So she was disarmingly informal, my mother. But at the same time, she also married this with a huge sense of occasion. And, and, and respect for legacy. And, and, and absolutely respect for her legacy, yeah. yeah. Um, so we, if we fast forward um, 30 years, this is where I can sort of contribute in some way in terms of my experience of, of, of grandma's homes and, and spending time alongside her there. After grandpa died, um, having lived in the countryside on and off throughout their lives, she made the big move from Hampshire to London. And, you know, she was very committed to finding a house that was an extension of the life that she knew it, but also uh, a house that mirrored the demands of her life at that moment in time. And, and she was incredibly sort of sensitive to her needs in that respect. Um, this house was a charming house, much like a country cottage, sort of rammed between yes, it stucco was, fronted. It was sort of in, in Holland Park. I mean, not on Holland Park, but in Holland Park. And it was sort of surrounded by music moguls, stucco residences. And this was like a country cottage. And you went through the gate and up this little garden path to the front door. With a, with a sort of sign that said, wipe your paws as you walked in. I mean, it sort of yes. summed it up. Yeah. And so, it, and it was completely charming, but also it was it was it was compact, and she was very um, you know once again you know we're seeing the sort of conscious decision of what she wanted to bring into this house and what she wanted to achieve in doing so. I mean, by then she had probably ten out of her fourteen, thirteen grandchildren, and it was about welcoming all of us into this home. Yeah, well, yeah, indeed it was, along with the chairman the creative director of the National of the Theatre, yes. people who are writing books about her father, etc., etc. So again, it's, in a way, it's a working house. A working house, but a working house filled with extraordinary things. So, you know, here we have her, her, her favourite portrait um, of her father by Oswald Burley, um, and equally a bust of her by by um, Oscar Naimon, amongst other photographs, Snowden's um, photograph of her mother. So, you know, there was this ex extraordinary sense of legacy and, and respect for, um, respect for what, 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 what was surrounding her. But at the same time, it was a lived-in and characterful house that said a lot about her sense of style. I mean, this room was... Um, not as we know um, kitchen extensions today. You know, so many people would have knocked it down and exactly. not lived with the galley kitchen or the, the oven that never quite worked or she didn't sort of seem to notice that. But, but you know, here we've got this sort of charming, now discontinued Brunswick and Feast wallpaper, very much leading you out to the garden beyond. And, and Grandma diarised, much like her mother, everything. You know, every recipe was kept. Every garden seed packet was kept. We have now taken this trestle. I couldn't bear to see it go anywhere that, that now sits in my parents' house, untouched. And 
um, you know, this this wonderful way of living in the moment, and also the the what I certainly relate to the, the collecting of what's ordinary as well as of what's extraordinary and the importance of displaying that too and and what can achieve be achieved in doing so and I think for me as a child this house really struck me as that there was no sort of pomposity her father's dispatch box was by the front door dare I say it with the poo bags for her dog <laughs> as she went out to take him out late at night it there was just this lightness to it and and from a decorator's perspective it wasn't considered and she clearly had a very strong sense of what she wanted and what she liked and and as we all know that helps but she didn't feel like she was being scrutinized and and frankly if she was she didn't care but but it you know it, it sort of summed up a strong sense of style at that that point in her life i mean i remember her asking me to recover these armchairs that were always by her fire. And it didn't matter to her at all what they looked like, you know, same venison print or whatever. What mattered is what they felt like and that they felt unchanged. And it's those sort of links of, of association from where that chair sat in the house that she lived in previously with her husband and the many stories that surround that. And in that sense, we've sort of created the same. I mean. Those curtains, Emma, when she sold the house. Yes, well, you, you, your eye fell on those, and um, you had them made into this divine green and white silk stripe, and Flora had them made into cushions. So we've all got a bit of a green and white arms. cushions, yeah. which is very, very nice thing to have. And I'm fighting off my daughter from handing them over. <laughs> and I think that would have brought her enormous pleasure. And this loo, sort of tiny loo, you could, could barely stand up in it, again with that Brintwigan feast wallpaper, which her niece, Edwina Sands, wrote on every spine of book, either a volume that her father had written or sort of a sort of total variety of, frankly, pretty eclectic um, um, books. But, you know, everything was characterful, everything was quirky, and it was very... And, and frankly pretty undecorated. It was very true to her. And her bedroom was very feminine. She slept in her mother's old bed with a portrait above her of her father that was, was painted by her nephew. Um, you know, endless trinkets and the old Colfax curtains. It, it's, it's a very evocative space and you can see where that's come from in terms of her family home and the home she lived in, but also you can see the direction, hopefully, that that's moved in, in terms of, hopefully, the effect it's um, had on, on all of us. I mean, moving forwards, this is my family home. Um, so my father married my mother, who ha was brought up in North Norfolk, and it's at the center of a working farm. And it's a home that we have all, as a family, really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly a, a, a lived-in home. It gets quite a, a, a battering. But it's an eclectic and layered home. And I think she took, Grandma took great pleasure in seeing how um, the cycle of, of, of some of these objects moving through generations in a different setting and being lived with in a different way. But emphasis on the lived with. Um, she was wonderful with all of our, our children. Sadly, she didn't meet my, my daughter. But, you know, the enjoyment she got from them um, sort of thumping around alongside well, she, these what things. What she loved doing was seeing what following generations did with their houses because she saw a different riff on what she'd been doing, so totally. to speak, and seeing some of her things in a different setting. In my case, she saw a picture. She said, oh, darling. That's a very nice painting. Where did that come from? Oh, I said, your <laughs> attic. Yes. <laughs> but also, so, uh, she, um, I mean, she really understood the value of what it went into it. I mean, I was starting to, to, to decorate myself when I lived round the corner from her. And these very long dinners, her stamina sort of saying one more cocktail and me sort of longing to go to bed. <laughs> um, but, but the sort of the, 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 the real interest in that process, it wasn't one that passed her by whilst it wasn't one that she herself, you know, in, yeah. sort of indulged in. And, and I mean, that, that really summed her up. I mean, here in this house, you're seeing um, eclecticism on another level, you know, a, a horse's head 
purchased from an, an, an antique shop in Arezzo that's been dragged back um, to North Norfolk and some pretty battered, battered cushions. This is an Edwardian house. It's not a particularly, um, it's not a particularly pretty house. It's a handsome house. But again, it's a workhorse. I mean, you know, when one looks at Chartwell as a working house, this is a, this is a working house. And it's one where you are always aware of where everyone in the house is. And it's humming with, with, with noise and, and personality and character. And I certainly, in, in terms of talking about sort of inherited sense of style, you know, this, this notion of collecting the ordinary and the less ordinary, you know, on here you've got Christmas cards from 10 years ago that haven't been thrown away alongside a bust of my great-grandmother, a photograph of my father at his christening, and, and all of us, you know, as children. And all of it has a point of reference inevitably and therefore all of it is is given a sort of a, a, a position of importance um, and I think that's something we see time and time again I mean here you know a, a typically Edwardian uh, cloakroom with you know a wonderful photograph of the sort of imposing statue of him in Parliament Square alongside um, a Suffolk punch that, that pulls the cart and 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 so the story, and so the story goes on. I mean, I feel having looked at the slides that we've been looking at with this image, there is that real sense of continuity in terms of of how a home is is put together. And I don't mean just in terms of the, you know, exquisite objects within this room, but also the the the, the sense of layering and needing to position those many faces on that table. I mean, there's one photograph there in the middle that is yes, of, of um, my mother and her father um, on board <coughs> HMS Renown. Um, my mother went to the Quebec conference in 1943 as with him as her, his ADC. And this is coming back on Renown. And it was rather an eventful uh, voyage for my mother because one, she nearly got swept overboard by a very strong wave and she had her 21st birthday so um, it was, I don't think she'll ever forget it but it's, it's the most charming picture of them and it, and it sort of um, does demonstrate their closeness in a way Absolutely. And, and I mean, as a room, this, this particular shot, you know, really um, emphasizes a continuation of that legacy, you know, carrying it on. The, the wonderful portrait by, uh, picture by Churchill of the Olive Groves above the mantelpiece, and, and I, I believe a set of Sevres china that was given to him by, by uh, the state of France um, as, a, as a gift. And, um, that being amalgamated into other strands of, of a new family's life um, and the balance between the two, which as a decorator is, is I think, one of the most interesting um, jobs, really. It's, 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 you know, the carrying of the many personalities within a house and, and juggling that and recording that, you know, as someone who collects and hangs, frankly, anything on a wall. Um, you know, I love the opportunity when a client says, you know, here are these photographs, plates, stamps, doesn't matter what it is, it's, it's got this, this significance to, to be seen and a story to tell. Um, and here is this very layered um, story spanning, spanning several families in several years. Um, about six years ago, I moved to um, North Dorset. Sadly, Grandma was no longer alive to be able to visit me there, but I think it's a home she would have enjoyed kicking back and um, having a cocktail. This was a beautiful sunburst uh, clock that she gave me. We saw it in her kitchen at West House, and um, it has moved with me and has um, prime position wherever it goes. Um, here, you know, I love the sense of patina, putting it on this old Fortuny um, panel that I purchased inevitably for a client but couldn't quite bear to part with. And, you know, this was a rented house. So for me, here I'm sort of, you know, hankering for those, those houses that have, 
layers and patina and, and you know, a sense of age. And, and inevitably, that, that clock and those, those you know, pieces that I've amassed uh, achieve that. Equally here, after Grandma died, there was a sale at Sotheby's um, of some of her belongings. And some of the belongings were just, you know, we all had one or two things that we couldn't bear to um, part with. And this was her sofa. I think she'd approve of the endlessly muddy pools sort of trampling all over it. But it's, um, it's comfortable, it's, it's, it's tired, and it says so much about her style um, and being able to sort of carry that through. Um, after Grandpa died, uh, she was made the chairman of the National Theatre, which was a job that she did extraordinarily well. And, and it was quite a controversial position because she wasn't, you know, in, in that world per se, was she? she no, was and the, um, all the high-ups at the National Theatre thought it was a Tory plot yeah. when she was first appointed. And then loved her. I mean, oh, she became the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this cushion um, was given to her for her 65th birthday, and it was made from um, fragments from the wardrobe department, the costume department at the National. And it now sits on my sofa. I like to think that, you know, maybe Ian McKellen was sort of strutting the boards mm -hmm. as Hamlet or, or something. But, you know, for her, everything was kept. You, you can see I've done my sort of best at, at sort of darning it and keeping it going. But um, it really tells that story of every, everything having a place and a story. Similarly, her, her trunk that, that looks like I have the key that opens it. I long to be able to open it, but I can't. One day I'm going to have to break it open. But, you know, she kept everything. There's the visitor's book from the British residence. Tablecloths that were made for the party that you had there, that marvelous party. Yeah that we used at our wedding in December. And, and so the, the, the story goes on, a family that can't throw anything away, evidently. Um, and you know, we see again, I mean, this is, you know, my um, cloakroom wall and, you know, myself, my siblings, but also photographs that I've been brought up with, you've been brought up with, and having them there, it's that trigger of association, really. Absolutely. And the comfort that it's comes a Proustian with it. hit every time. Every time. Yeah. Um, so here we end up in, in the house that I, I now live in, um, you know, with some of these objects telling a different story, sort of the backdrop of, of my now collection of fabrics, that wonderful Snowden portrait sort of staring out at you, sort of, you know, reminding me sort of daily to to sharpen up or smarten up or something. And, but also alongside, you know, my now new families, um, you know, members of, of, of family as well. And um, her wine cooler, I can see, sort of poking out the side there. You know, everything triggers a story of sorts. So I think in this sort of brilliant title or this brilliant quote that, that um, that was found about, you know, we shape our houses and thereafter they shape us. Um, for me, that's the essence of, of living in a house. You know, it's to what extent you're able to lean on it, what you wish to breathe into it, allowing it to constantly evolve. You know, a home is not a static thing and because our lives aren't static. And, um, you know, living and loving a home is when it really gives back to us. And, you know, they couldn't have found a more apt quote, of course, by Churchill to, to summarize yeah. it. But, um, you know, what an opportunity to, to actually be able to look through these houses as a result of this talk and sort of really be able to, to establish that thread. So, thank you. Only if anyone has right. one, yeah. 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 So you showed some of the walls where you put family pictures, uh, which are very much part of the home itself. But nowadays, when we are so much used to uploading our pictures on social media, do yes. you think it's changed our conception, our understanding of interior designing as well, this move towards the digital world? I, I think it's given us access 
or easier access to a sort of plethora of images and inspiration. I, I don't think you need to be a designer to be able to draw from that. I think, you know, whatever you're interested in or tuned into, there's so much more at our fingertips, and that is always a win. Um, I mean, in terms of how we document things, I mean, certainly the dreaded phone has made it more difficult. Um, you know, and you can become lazy in terms of what you pull out and what you frame and what you put on the wall. And, and therefore, I think the discipline of collecting, um, you know, the looser it can be, um, the better. But no, I think, I mean, I am not sort of technologically forward thinking myself, but, but, but I, it gives me access to archives of material that I would have never otherwise had, I think. I agree. Anything else? Hi. Hi. Thank you for today. I'm not sure. Um, I noticed you did a clever trick in your rented home. Yes. Um, having moved a lot yes. in a rented home, yeah. thinking about the day that I have my perfect green home that yes. I own. Yes, likewise. But, yeah. But for those, those that are in rented homes at the moment, I noticed that you put a panel against the wall. Obviously, you have restrictions in your rented homes about what you can do. Yes. Do. Well, I'm not, yes, I'm probably not very popular with my landlord as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Pins in every corner. But um, yes, I mean, I think, you know, pictures, I mean, that, that, that was because I wanted it to feel cozy and enveloping. And also I'd collect fabric so that that old Fortuny panel for me um, does so much. But bringing in curtains, bringing in pattern on sofas, layering where you can take it out. Um, achieve so much you know there, there are so many places that you can put color other than the walls um, and uh, I think that real sort of emphasis on collecting what you will take away with you rather than what you leave there and just waiting for the moment that you then get to really enjoy decorating the walls instead hi Timeless. Yes. Yes. Well, I think it's fascinating work, and I think you know you saying that makes me feel like I'm sort of step step in the right direction in in, in doing my job and, and sort of carrying out the styles of interiors that that make me happy. But um, well, I think you know here we are talking about women who didn't overthink it, um, didn't feel the need in their own homes to over decorate. Um, and, and really sort of followed their instinct in terms of what they liked. And it didn't matter if it went with or didn't go with. I think the sense of patina and age really helps that, the sense of timelessness. Um, but also, you can recreate that. I mean, I now have a collection of fabrics, and some of those fabrics are really quite vibrant, and I would say are very much inspired by the aesthetic of both of my grandmothers. There's one called the Dahlias, which is as OTT as you get, but, but it's, um, it's very much driven by nostalgia. And I think nostalgia and timelessness go hand in hand. And, and that's much of what this talk is about. You know, interiors or the homes we live in are triggers of, of times in our lives, people, places. And I think if you listen to that, then, then it's gonna give you pleasure. And if it gives you pleasure, hopefully anyone else who's in the house too. Well, in my own home, um, I mean, my husband dread, dreads going away on a Sunday because he comes back and I've moved everything all over again. So, uh, you know, for me, the rules are there aren't many, many rules. And, and there is an alchemy sometimes. You know, I, I have no training as an interior decorator. And I, therefore, I feel slightly fraudulent answering this question. But, um, you know, it, it's a very personal thing. And sometimes it fits and sometimes it doesn't. And... Sometimes the not quite fitting is when you're getting it right. So, of course, there are, as with anything like uh, words on a page, you know, there's, there's, there's a formula that makes the structure gel a bit more. But I think it's sort of allowing the personality 
to shine through that really is what makes a room sing myself. Hi. Yes. I'm not a decorator, yeah. so I don't know what happens after they buy the antiques. They say it just clashes and yeah. it breaks my heart because I don't want people to have to just fill their homes with IKEA just because the house was built as it is. I think it's a challenge. I think it's certainly a challenge. Um, and I think, you know, it, you can with your home. I mean, you know, a lot of it is, is sort of... Uh, it's a stage set, really. I mean, it's a stage set that we live on, and and and. But but it is a stage set, and so I think you can be clever with with what you're disguising, with what you're hiding, with what you're seeing, where you're drawing your eye to, where you're not. But but no, I think the demands of of, of some of the houses that are, that are built today, if you're not able to be instrumental into the putting together of what what that is, is definitely very very challenging. But if you're selling them an exquisite 18th century, um, you know, grandfather clock, that's going to detract your eye from the, the, the double glazing, that's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Could I ask not really about your interior design, but how you feel, how you both feel, you know, to spend your time greatness and being part of a family that's so well known, how much pressure do you feel that, you know, maybe you've Emma, that's... Well, uh, well, personally, I have to say that my attitude to it has changed over time. Okay. And when I was 22, I would change continents not to be related to anybody in my family at all. <laughs> <laughs> and now I regard it as an immense privilege. Yeah. And anything I can do, which isn't very much, but anything I can do to keep the flame, so to speak, I will happily do. You, you come across as both of you very, very proud of your heritage. No, certainly. I mean, it would be difficult not to. Um, um, exactly, it's something to be enormously proud of. And it, of course, it comes with responsibility. But we're very lucky also to have these wonderful stories that, that, that is the result of, yeah. of spending time with, with, with you know, these extraordinary personalities. And you know, it is, it's not many families can look at their grandparents' or great grandparents' house, where it, which was sort of technically as accurate as any film set could ever be. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, that, I mean, I take my mother's word for its accuracy because I never knew it at that time. But um, it's, it's rather marvelous that the generations roll on. But um, there are certain things that that is remaining the same. I have to say, thanks to the National Trust. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I just wanted to ask, Yes, I think it's, I think it's um, going to be very, very difficult for people. I mean, personally, I'm not working on a memoir of somebody in the email age, but I pity anybody who is. I think it must make life extremely difficult. And I long to talk to, for instance, um, Staney, who, who, John Staney, is he called, who is the man at the University of Texas who buys up many, many collections, archives of writers. Um, many British writers have ended up there. Because at the moment, it's very, very rich, and it's all written, mostly written word. But he, hopefully, somebody like him has a theory of how to go from here. Yeah. 
No, and we were extraordinary with Grandma because she was incredibly prolific in her writing. I mean, she would get up at the crack of dawn and she would write. She we would admit she was never good late at night, but she was always good early in the morning. But she would also document everything and, and the enjoyment that we, we'd get from that. But she came from a, a long line of, of diary keepers and letter yeah. writers. And, and she also knew the, yes, the relevance mean, of her there was correspondence sort of a sort of curious for later generations. Gene in the Churchills which was keeping everything. I mean, literally, my grandfather practically kept his laundry lists from Harrow School, you know, and, and so they threw absolutely nothing away. And that black box with Mary Soames written on it, the archives at Chartwell, they were just slinging mm. the papers in those boxes. And um, now, of course, they're at Churchill College, um, and all, the entire collection has been digitized, which is probably the way forward. But they haven't had to look at the email problem. No. Or the WhatsApp messaging. Or the, yeah. yeah. We all have wonderful, rich conversations with our children. Um, yeah. But, but where do you keep it? It will never be captured. Mm. No, it's a worry. Is there anything else? No. Hi. Hi. Oh goodness. Well, I was just thinking um, about sort of different ways of keeping a diary, and um, as a collector, I think my ever eclectic collection is my diary. And I was thinking, you know sadly no longer with us, but you know, Robert Kimes' collection is his diary. And it's the diary of his taste through the ages. And he certainly um, was an extraordinary decorator, an extraordinary brain, and a phenomenally generous um, man um, within the industry. So I her herald his, his career as being a great one. Um, and I think there are many, you know, it's, 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 it's quite a saturated market. There are lots of us, and that's great, horses for courses, and really interesting young decorators um, coming up through the ranks, and um, everyone with a different take. Um, you know, I am not a minimalist, evidently, and so I, you know, I look to those who love collecting, who love color, um, and uh, yes, I mean, you know, here in, in England and in the States, an extraordinary um, sort of heritage of, of, of decorators sort of, you know, throughout the years. So, I mean, where does one start? But right now, ringing in my ears is, is Robert. You know, he's, he, was, he was one of the best, and we won't see that for a while. He obviously bought everything that he saw, yeah. that he liked, yeah. which is what I would love to do. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have the same, so I do it when he's not looking, but, but I know, I know. But when, when, do you, when do you regret it? I mean, when do you, you know, that's the thing. My problem is parting with it. But um, uh, he had an extraordinary eye, you know. But it's interesting, you know, he's buy, he, you know, in this cell he's buying for his own home. It's a very different thing when you're buying for someone else's home, and it's a different discipline, and it's a different art, because we walk away and we don't live in those houses they do and that's what matters so you know it's one thing the houses you're seeing here that's my personal taste um, but you know decorating for, for someone else is a very different kettle of fish because everyone has you know a different side of the bed a different you know way of turning their light switch on etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, it's it's very varied and interesting but yeah the collectors that's that's a diary in itself that's an art form Mm. We're going to have a look tomorrow. Yes, we must. And Lois is going to ask, where do you recommend buying, or where do you think about buying? Because there's obviously the top rank auction on houses, there's one below, there's things like the Bath and West show you can yeah. go through that has a stretch. Well, I mean, the, the sale room is brilliant here in the UK because it represents all of those. Um, and uh, you know, very fortunate that it's brought, brought to our doorstep. I mean, I, I always find the longer the track to get to the antique shop, the better what I'm going to find at the end of it, you know. Um, uh, and so it's just sort of, you know, traveling, not necessarily knowing where you're going, 
Instagram is an amazing portal for access to, to dealers um, who you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, but also, it's a changing market. There's a huge interest in design and homemaking, as there should be. So it's not no longer as exclusive to the trade, so we all have to work a bit harder. And um, that's great, too. But I, I think it's, um, yeah, being out and about is, is, is the best way. But sale room is where you see the full gambit of from the top auction houses down. And the regional auction houses are treasure troves. Definitely. Perfect. Thank you.